Greetings to everyone with us. On behalf of the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, I would like to welcome you to the seventh lecture of the GP2 lectures this academic year. This series is organized by the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, which is part of our Faculty of Philosophy here at the Angelicum in Rome. This lecture, as well as the entire GP2 lecture series, could not have taken place without the support of our university authorities, Father Thomas Joseph White, Director of Angelicum, and Father Sir Thomas Bonino, the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy, whom I would like to thank. Special thanks are also in order to the founders of St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, donors and supporters of the Institute, our audience and all viewers in front of the screens. The St. John Paul II Institute of Culture was established to look at the challenges facing the modern world at the church in light of the life and thought of St. John Paul II. The idea of thinking with John Paul II has been embodied in the GP2 lecture series, which are monthly lectures of eminent interdisciplinary academics who will revisit the extraordinary contribution of John Paul II for our own day. At the previous GP2 lecture, we had the honor of hosting Dr. Dariusz Karłowicz. Dr. Karłowicz has raised the issue of political and legal stability within Western societies, which despite decades of political projects oriented towards building stability and prosperity, are sinking into different forms of entrenched injustice. Dariusz Karłowicz tried to answer the question how the experience of historical shocks can help us find a solution to our contemporary crisis of toxic stability. In our series plan for this entire academic year, 2022-2023, we will host such eminent lecturers as Father Thierry Dominique Umbrecht and Father Franciszek Longchamp de Berrier. Now, I'm pleased to give the floor to Dariusz Karłowicz, the initiator of the GP2 lecture series, philosopher, president of St. Nicholas Foundation, strategic partner of the Institute, and the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture program director. Dariusz Karłowicz will share more about our today's special guest. Good afternoon. Dear friends, it's my honor to introduce to you Russell Ronald Reno, a acclaimed American theologian and ethicist. Um, Reno has served as editor of First Things since 2011. He received his PhD in theology from Yale University and taught theology and ethics at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska for 20 years. He has published uh, in many academic journals and his opinions, essays have appeared in uh, Commentary, National Review, The Wall Street Journal, Washington Post and The New York Times and other popular outlets. His most recent books include The End of Interpretation, Return of a Strong God and Resurrecting the Idea of a Christian society. What's the topic of a lecture? In his lecture titled Christians in the Face of Political Polarization, Professor Reno will look at the phenomenon of growing disintegration in the political culture of the West, the source of which, according to the lecturer, is disintegration, a decline in trust in core institutions. The lecture will explore the causes of disintegration which rest in the paradoxical establishment of a permanent revolution. In the liquefied world, the solid reality of church and authority of the apostolic inheritance 
can anchor people's lives and provide um, refuge, if not a solution in our era of disintegration. Dear Rusty, the floor is yours. Thank you for that uh, gracious introduction and thanks uh, to um, the Angelicum and to the John Paul II Institute for issuing this invitation to come and speak to you. It was a good opportunity for me to, to try to think about how to, how to describe and analyze the current political situation and to do so um, against the horizon of my own commitment um, to uh, a, a theological frame of reference. But I should warn you before I begin that I'm a recovering academic uh, in the sense that I functioned as a professor for 20 years and then more than 10 years ago uh, began as editor of First Things Magazine. And so that thrust me from a certain kind of intellectual engagement at a distance from political and public affairs to an engagement that's much more um, uh, immediate and, and uh, more, more actively involved. And so this talk is gonna reflect that more um, granular, close connection to political realities. And I'm gonna try to build up, if you will, from the particular to conclude with more general statements about um, our, our witness um, as, as Catholics and Christians in the present age. So with that, with that kind of prefatory warning that we're gonna get a kind of close discussion of political realities and, and work our way towards theology, I'll, I'll, I'll get going. Well, we live in paradoxical times. Talk of debilitating polarization is commonplace. It's right there in the title of my talk. And yet the streets are calm and the wheels of commerce continue to spin. Global worthies jet to Davos unhindered and unmolested. As one wag put it a few years ago, the masses are not marching in the streets in search of a final solution. They're looking for a final sale. In my estimation, it's worth dwelling on this paradox to get going uh, this afternoon. It's a paradox that combines anxious foreboding with a strangely inert social situation. Compare this, the Spanish Civil War raged from 1936 to 1939, and contemporaries recognized that this conflict was a proxy war between fascism and communism. And the conflict divided artists, writers, and intellectuals. There's a great letter exchange between Jacques Maritain and Garrigou Lagrange um, about the Spanish Civil War, a very bitter um, uh, letter exchange between the two of them. Now compare the 1930s to the present war in Ukraine. Like the Spanish Civil War, the battle in Eastern Ukraine is a proxy war between the American dominated system and what is often called by commentators revisionist powers. But I would submit that the ideological element seems relatively insignificant. Now to be sure, some worry about escalation. I count myself among those who have that worry. But over the last year, this proxy war has not fomented bitter divisions in our societies. And I think the same can be said about the supposedly dangerous populist, so-called populist movements. Brexit, law and justice in Poland, Orban's government in Hungary, Salvini, Maloney, we can go on. All of these phenomena are felt as crises and threats to the system, and yet nothing really changes. The global economic system adapts to new geop geopolitical realities, mass migration, legal and illegal, paired with low birth rates in the West, continue to accelerate demographic change. The LGBT juggernaut remains unstoppable. And behind it all, the American military machine continues to hum. In sum, for all the uproar about so-called threats to democracy, we're still partying like it's 1999. But I think that's not quite right. We're not still partying like it's 1999. We feel in our bones 
that all is not well in our societies. For, and I would argue that we do, we're justified, I'm going to argue uh, this afternoon, we're justified in feeling that all is not well. Because we're undergoing a disintegration born of the metaphysical impoverishment of the West. Vatican II sensed this impoverishment and sought to address it, as have subsequent pontificates, including that of Pope Francis. Tonight, however, I want to develop a diagnosis of our metaphysical impoverishment from a political angle rather than taking a more direct philosophical or theological approach, hence my warning kind of building up from below uh, with observations rather than a higher level philosophical or theological analysis of this metaphysical impoverishment, which I think has been done very well um, from, from many circles. So, from below. We're awash with material wealth and we enjoy unprecedented freedom. Yet our institutions are crumbling and this leaves us vulnerable and aimless. As a result, I would say we're not so much polarized as atomized as a society. Our political cultures feel dysfunctional, not because of fervent ideological passions that are in hand-to-hand -hand combat with each other, but rather because many in the West feel frustrated, cynical, and angry. So it's a deep dissatisfaction with the status quo, even though it doesn't really manifest itself as a kind of ideological clash. Now, populism is notoriously ill-defined, but I think it's fair to say that it takes an oppositional stance that is fueled by anger and frustration. Populism reflects the fact that the demos, the many, are losing confidence in the aristoi, in the few who guide and govern. And we certainly have polarization in that sense, the polarization between the many and the few as manifest in you know, various populist uh, um, rebellions of uh, electoral rebellions, not literal rebellions, electoral rebellions. And so it seems to me that the deep question concerning po polarization is the following, which is this, why has the dominant consensus in the West lost its authority? I mean, why, is the, why does the worldview of the few, why is it losing its grip on the social imaginations of the many? I think I can answer why this consensus is failing anecdotally. In The Strange Death of Europe, Douglas Murray observes that for two generations, voters have demanded less in immigration, but politicians never deliver uh, uh, and, and reduce it. Thomas Piketty has charted the growing income inequality in our new Gilded Age, and Charles Murray, the American sociologist in his book, Coming Apart, has documented an even greater inequality of social capital in, in the West. But instead of taking this anecdotal approach, I want to sketch a more systematic, if you will, political scientific answer to the question about why the consensus in the West has um, lost its grip on, on the imagination of the many. So in this more systematic answer, I want to begin with the author of The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Not known as a great political scientist, but I think um, uh, a person well worth our attention uh, in this setting. Now, among the few Englishmen of his day, uh, Coleridge studied in Germany, and he was influenced by the, he read German, and was influenced by the critical philosophy of Kant and Hegel. And toward the end of his life, he wrote a treatise of social philosophy that I commend to you. Its title is On the Constitution of Church and State. And in that treatise, like everything he did in the final 30 years of his life, he never completed it. Um, but nonetheless, uh, in that treatise, he draws upon Hegel's notion of culture as a system of antagonistic principles that are engaged in fruitful tension with each other very Hegelian uh, notion. And he identifies two elements, two antagonistic elements in modern theology, in modern, excuse me, modern society. Now one element 
he calls the party of permanency, which is dominated by a clerisy. And this is a term that Coleridge coined uh, for those who uphold established norms and institutions. In his time, the clerisy, this clerisy included literal clergy who are spokesmen of orthodoxy. But lawyers and judges are also part of the clerisy. And so are intellectually minded aristocrats and anyone really who's invested in maintaining the status quo is a, uh, intellectually engaged in maintaining the status quo as a member of this clerisy that, that um, uh, provides the, 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 uh, the kind of urgency to the party of permanency. Now opposed to the party of permanency is the party of change. In this cohort, one finds the leading men of commerce, inventors, and other engines of economic transformation. Uh, Coleridge was very aware of the, 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 when he wrote this in 1830, the first wave of the Industrial Revolution was well on its way, at transforming the um, English society and the English countryside. But also political reformers and radicals fall into the, this category in the party of change, as do literary figures and artists who, criti who criticize or, or mock or satirize the status quo. Now, by Coleridge's reckoning, the body politic is kept in equilibrium by an ongoing tension between the party of permanency and the party of change. The former, the party of change, uh, the party of per permanency, checks the rashness and impatience of the latter, while the party of change challenges the complacency and indifference of the party of permanency. And in 18th century English politics, this fruitful tension played out in Whig and Tory contests for power. And by the mid 19th century, those political parties in England took on a more self-consciously ideological self-definition, gave, which gave rise to the polarity between liberal on the one hand, the party of change, and conservative on the other, the party of permanency. Which, in, which, although it, it, it remains the political vocabulary for American politics, liberal versus conservative. I know in the European context, liberal has a different meaning. But in the United States, uh, it takes on that pure Coleridgean meaning of the party of change. Liberals see themselves as agents of change in economics and in politics and in morals. And the moderates of this party are reformists, while the radicals are revolutionaries. Meanwhile, conservatives use their authority as grandees within the status quo to provide a break, and in that way to limit change and ensure social continuity. That's the fruitful tension between these two um, uh, polar, po uh, polar opposites in society. So with that Coleridgean uh, system in mind, I can say that in my lifetime, this system has broken down. And I submit that this breakdown is why we're experiencing so much political and social turmoil. The party of permanency draws its power from established institutions that have a vested interest in sustaining their own authority. And although it's hard for young people to, to believe, Modern universities, have been, while they've been sources of scientific innovation, have until recently been culturally conservative. They functioned, have, they functioned to preserve a cultural canon and to pass down literary, philosophical, and historical inheritances to the next generation. And of course, devoted to the transmission of the apostolic inheritance, churches have been even more conservative uh, uh, in, in, in the modern era. And the same is true for judges and lawyers who in the Anglo-Saxon tradition see themselves of guard, as guardians of a settled body of legal precedent. And I could go on. Parents pass down a familial inheritance, literary critics and museum curators maintain st standards of judgment. Now, of course, none of these authorities are immobile and traditions are living things. Something like John Henry Newman's notion of the development of doctrine obtains for the party of permanency. But my point is this. Over the last two generations, my lifetime, the institutions that anchor society have been taken over by the party of change. So that, if you will, the, 
source of the authority of the Party of Permanency has been stripped from them and has been taken over by the Party of Change. Now, in my recent book, The Return of the Strong Gods, I advance a historical thesis to explain the ascendancy of the Party of Change and the demise of the Party of Permanency, the breakdown, in other words, of this fruitful tension that Coleridge identifies. And my thesis, put simply, is that the catastrophic decades of the early 20th century destroyed the credibility of the old authorities. And I document the way in which wartime intellectuals theorized a new start in the West after World War II, uh, kind of build back better uh, after the end of World War II, and it, one that would, as I document in some detail, promote an open society consensus. And it's worth looking ever so briefly at what Karl Popper, the way he describes or he outlines this consensus in his influential 1944 book, Open Society and Its Enemies. If you read those two volumes, you'll discover that Karl Popper believed that we must jettison metaphysics if we are to prevent the return of Hitler. By his analysis, the Western tradition of searching for timeless truths encourages totalitarianism. And therefore, he argues, to ensure an open society, we must be satisfied with meaning rather than truth. In other words, rather than aspiring to wisdom, we should seek technocratic expertise to increase utility and to manage social tensions. Uh, it's really striking, you know, he, he argues that an open society has to adopt uh, um, uh, an Occamist nominalist view of, 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 uh, of, of things. So he specifically endorses nominalism as, uh, as an anti-metaphysical um, uh, approach to talking about things like, well, talking about reality. Now, the political economic aspect of the open society consensus was expressed by Friedrich Hayek in his book, Road to Serfdom, which was published right around the same time as The Open Society and Its Enemies. And the Austrian economist argued that robust conceptions of the common good contain always the seeds of totalitarianism. And therefore, we should turn away from governance as the way to organize our societies and move towards market mechanisms as the source of social organization. <laughs> Four, the market coordinates human behavior in accord with free decisions based on personal judgments. Easy just to sort of, you know, Friedrich Hayek, a kind of iconic figure for the American right. Uh, Karl Popper, Open Society and Its Enemies. Of course, George Soros's Open Society uh, Foundation to, uh, quite self-consciously takes its name from uh, Popper's book. He was a student of Karl Popper's at the London um, School of Economics in the early 1950s. George Soros was very much influenced by Popper. Uh, so these are obviously deeply uh, embedded in, in, the, in the consensus that has governed our, our societies for decades and is very much still uh, what the elite consensus holds. Now in The Return of the Strong Gods, my book, I trace the evolution of the open society consensus. And among establishment liberals in the United States, it, was, it begins with a carefully calibrated balance between authority and openness. It's interesting, nobody really wanted to get rid of authority. Party of Permanency still had, its, had life in it. Um, and in that sense, echoes Coleridge. And the title of Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s programmatic book for post-war America, published in 1949, his title really tells it all. And the title is The Vital Center. But the prestige of openness, I submit, foredoomed this balance between the party of permanency and the party of change. And in a few short decades after the liberation of Auschwitz, the West was championing openness as the supreme good. The neoliberal consensus of the 1990s very self-consciously combined Karl Popper with Friedrich Hayek. Uh, it's interesting, addressing the United Nations in 1991, George H.W. Bush hymned the virtues of open trade, open borders, and as he said, most important of all, open minds. The upshot today is not just a fluid world of global commerce, but a liquefied moral imagination as well, which is symbolized by the rainbow flag 
and it's promised that we can cross boundaries and create new ways of living, even to the point of traversing the biological difference between men and women. I mean, that's the open society, sort of open gender, you know, open borders, open trade, open mind, open, open uh, borders between the male and the female. I think it's of a piece with what, what we've been urging for decades now. And as you know, the American embassies around the world fly the rainbow flag. And this American, my, my, my government's embrace of the rainbow flag is a clear sign that the anti-metaphysical party of change has become the establishment party in the West. And the same goes for the free market program of bringing the entire world into the global economic system. When very nearly all the powerful people in the West preach the virtue of diversity and inclusion and sing hosannas to the benefits of innovation and creative destruction, then we know that the party of permanency has become very nearly defunct. Now, two consequences, I think, follow from the demise of the party of permanency and the ascendancy of the party of change into the establishment party. First, as the party of change assumes control of foundational institutions in our societies, the ones anchoring realities of our lives are made more flexible, more porous, and the, there's the word there, more open. See, obviously, marriage provides an example here. Uh, you know, the open marriage concept of the 70s, uh, no-fault divorce, uh, and then on to redefinition of marriage uh, to allow men to marry men and so on and so forth. This is obviously a kind of making the institution of marriage far more plastic um, and, and flexible and by nature more porous and less, um, less authoritative in, in the West. And a similar process has taken place in universities, museums, and in certain religious communities. As Gianni Vattimo urges, we must embrace, and this is his terminology, the weakening of being. I recommend Vattimo because he's a kind of theorist of the sort of the metaphysics of an anti-metaphysics, so to speak, or metaphysical language deployed to be anti-metaphysical. And the upshot is a social environment of diminished institutions that are less capable of commanding assent and giving stability to our lives. In short, we see around us the disintegration of social forms and the atomization of individuals. And so, as, as, as we all know, Many in the West today are more likely to be formed in the fluid world, of the surreal world of social media than they are to be formed by traditional institutions. That's the first consequence, the, the kind of uh, diminution of the authority of institutions. Now the second consequence of the ascendancy of the party of change is, I think can be described in a more narrowly political terms. There are, truth be told, and this institution is one of them, or, or harbors many of them, there are some segments of society that continue to endorse the old authorities. And I kind of label them in a flippant way by the three Fs, faith, family, and flag. But these people are no longer in charge of core institutions in the West, the folks who, who continue to endorse the old authorities. Those who draw upon medical truths do not wield establishment power in the West in the 21st century. On the contrary, media, universities, foundations, and other institutions denounce those who endorse uh, metaphysical truths as, quote, fearful of change. At best, that's if you're lucky. Or at worst, people like me are denounced as haters or homophobes or suffering from some, some other moral pathology. Over time, therefore, the former members, I mean, you know, at some point when you're told that you don't belong to the, uh, to the future, the future, so to speak, over time, former members of the party of permanency, those who adhere to unbending truths, we, we people like me, begin to regard the status quo as hostile. Now, outside the establishment, somebody like me will shift towards a populist stance or even a counter-revolutionary stance. I think this is probably one of the, uh, a fruitful sociological way to think about uh, 
um, interest in the Latin mass, traditional Latin mass in the United States as a kind of anti or questioning of Second Vatican Council and things like that. I think it's probably, it's not so much an intellectual project as is just an expression of rebellion against a status quo that, that um, is deemed hostile to uh, metaphysical truth. Now the collapse of the old balance between the permanency and change puts us in, I think, a confusing situation in, in, 20, in, the, in the 2020s. As Hannah Arendt observed in The Origins of Totalitarianism, an atomized population unmoored from traditional institutions, which she very much feared, that this kind of atomized population is more available to demagoguery than a traditionally formed population. In other words, paradoxically, the anti-totalitarian open society consensus now makes the West more vulnerable to disordered and destructive politics. The almost total triumph of the party of change has given revolutionaries and their fellow travelers possession of the institutions that formerly anchored society. And with that control, they have imposed an obligatory weakening of being on, using Vatimo's term, weakening of being on all the institutions of the West. I mean, as I get, I think marriage is an obvious example. National sovereignty, though, and other aspects. Uh, the very notion of truth itself, uh, uh, you know, is, is scientific objectivity uh, a form of white supremacy? I mean, we, we could kind of ring the changes on um, all kinds of aspects of the solid things of the Western tradition being, um, being rendered in doubt and the goal to make them more mobile, more adaptable. Meanwhile, while the, the, uh, some of the more, more radical uh, elements of the party of change take control of institutions, those who, meanwhile, those who retain metaphysical conditions, uh, convictions, and, and there are many of us who do so in the West, we increasingly become bent on overturning the status quo. As again, and then against populist challenges, the party of change paradoxically deploys institutional power to maintain the status quo, which is, you know, a status quo of perpetual revolution, permanent revolution. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a kind of, uh, to, to, uh, to endorse uh, sort of the metaphysical anchors of the West is denounced as fascism, and those in positions of, thor of, of authority wind up supporting anti-fascism. Anyway, it's a very paradoxical situation, hard to orient yourself to. I mean, I think that uh, Pope Benedict's notion of dictatorship of relativism captures something of that, parado that paradox, dictatorship and relativism uh, together. Now, by my analysis, the demise of the fruitful tension Coleridge identified now is what's now generating our polarized politics. And even worse, it encourages a nihilistic politics. After all, populists talk about overthrowing elites. And meanwhile, progressives talk about, and this is a quote from an organization in Minnesota, progressives talk about abolishing the social order and building a new society. You know, when the Ford Foundation, Great Establishment Foundation in America, funds organizations that have as their goal abolishing the social order, and you have um, populists talking about draining the swamp, everybody seems to be bent on, on somehow dismantling or disintegrating the status quo. It's, uh, and so you're, le you're left to wonder, in this present situation, who is loyal to the status quo? Who is applying the brakes in the present political situation? Now, certainly the Davos crowd and other elites have an investment in the way things are. They profit handsomely from the way things are. But nearly all the establishment grandees in the West now see themselves as members of the party of change. So they, they ideologically have, a, they, they want an open society. Indeed, they often speak about wanting an open world. As a result, even though these powerful people are at the helm, 
they find it very difficult to resist more radical, what goes by the name of change agents. The dominance of the party of change over every institution of the West, aside from the Catholic Church and some Protestant communities, explains why the woke revolution has gained such sway. Uh, you know, it's, there are no antibodies to radicalism in the party of change uh, because the party of change always used to rely on the party of permanency to apply the brake. And so when it's in charge, there, there's, no, there's no emergency brake in that vehicle. Um, and and it, it makes it very difficult. That's why Ivy League uh, university pres presidents really find themselves unmanned by the more radical uh, um, uh, folks at the university. And the dominance of the party of change over every institution in the West, I think also explains what today's paradoxical combination of radicalism and calm. Because the party of change, if I may put it paradoxically in my own words, has become the party of permanency. I mean, permanent revolution is a kind of odd combination of everything that's unsettled, but yet nothing changes because it's permanent. Now, I've sketched the sociological explanation of today's situation, and I want to shift gears and now take a second run at, at this phenomenon of disintegration as the root of our polarized politics. I want to take a second F, um, uh, approach that is, I think, more spiritual in its, in its, um, in its, in its uh, sentiment. In 1959, Philip Reif published a book called Freud, The Mind of the Moralist, which, by the way, is the best book you could possibly read on Sigmund Freud. Now, although Reif did, did not cite Coleridge in that volume, by his reading, Freud also proposed a mixed regime, although in this case of the soul rather than of society. It was a regime of the soul that were, which was made flexible by therapeutic intervention, but nevertheless backstopped by moral authority. Now, Reef was something of a celebrity um, in the late 1950s and early 1960s at a time when sociology was thought to be the queen of the sciences. So in the early 1960s, the National Council of Churches hired him to conduct a two-year study. The National Council of Churches is a church organization in the United States that represented what we call liberal Protestantism, which at that time was a very powerful force in American society and did a great deal to shape elite opinion. Now, as he spent those two years working um, uh, for the churches, Reef was shocked to discover that these church leaders in the mainline Protestantism were very eager to shed their roles as representatives of moral and religious authority. And this experience of clerical antinomianism deeply affected Reef. I think I was probably, I would argue, the, the most um, significant sort of experience he had in his life. And it shaped his most famous book, the Triumph of the Therapeutic, which was published in 1966. Freud, he wrote in a, in a summary of his earlier book, he gave a summary of the thesis of his earlier book. Freud, he said, emphasized coercion and the renunciation of instinct as indispensable elements of all culture. So there has to be a kind of, uh, uh, there has to be a kind of no at the root of any culture. But Reef recognized that a sentiment against renunciation was taking hold in the West after World War II. And it was taking hold even among those at the helm of authoritative institutions. So I want you to, I'll quote to you his dark foreboding in his own words. We can see what he foresees. So this is Reef. That such large numbers of the cultivated and intelligent have identified themselves deliberately with those who are supposed to have no love for instinctual renunciation suggests to me the most elaborate act of suicide that Western intellectuals have ever staged. Those intellectuals, whether of the left or the right, whose historic function it has been to assert the authority of a culture organized in terms of communal purpose through the agency of congregations of the faithful. 
Reef's not always the easiest guy to read. He has his own distinctive way of putting things. But let me try to elaborate on this. Reef sees this elaborate act of suicide playing out in efforts by Christian thinkers and leaders to relax sexual discipline. I mean, this is one instance. He thinks it's the most exemplary. It's this act of suicide is being conducted in every sphere, he thinks. But if we look at the question of sexual discipline, it becomes clear in his mind. And it's important to recognize here that the early stages of the sexual revolution came well before the events of 1968 uh, and certainly prepared the way for that, um, that, that moment. Now, Reef makes a straightforward, sets up his analysis by making a straightforward observation. This is how he puts it. In the classical Christian culture of commitment, one renunciatory mode of control referred to the sexual opportunism of individuals, end quote. Put simply, Christianity, I know this is news to you, disciplines our sexual desires. Yet, as he puts it, a new Christian apologetics says otherwise. Reef refers to the best-selling book, Honest to God, in which the Anglican Bishop John Robinson argues that Christianity, it was published in the early 1960s, argues that Christianity, properly understood, requires neither moral rigorism nor belief in the Nicene Creed. Now, Reef marvels at the bishop's performance, which, he, which his experiences at the National Council of Churches convinced him had actually become the norm in ecclesiastical elite Protestant circles. Quote, current apologetic efforts by religious professionals in pretending that renunciation as a general mode of control was never dominant in the system reflect the strange mis mixture of cowardice and courage with which they are participating in the disillusion of their cultural foundations, end quote. For Reef, the cowardice comes from capitulating to the therapeutic consensus, and the courage comes from the audacity to simply redefine by fiat Christianity in order to suit that cowardice. Now, Reef focuses on the Christian churches because he's an astute sociologist. He thinks that this kind of um, a, a renunciation of renunciation is widespread at every level of the, of the West. But he focuses on Christian churches because he recognizes that those ordained to speak on God's behalf have the greatest investment in sustaining the vertical axis of authority. He recognized that the clerical embrace of worldly permissions over divinely instituted renunciations indicates a sea change in the West. So when the clergy are renouncing renunciation, you know it's not your grandma's um, uh, uh, culture anymore, or I guess speaking in 2023, your great-great-great-grandma's culture anymore. And I think Reef was right about the general trend in the West. One is hard-pressed to find professors today who believe that there is an authoritative canon to say nothing of authoritative creeds. Multiculturalism in, in the United States functions as an obligatory anti-creedal therapy. And then students are trained in what we call critical thinking, the, for, the foremost criterion of which is the conviction that there are no authoritative truths. Now we have doctrines, of course, Patriarchy, heteronormativity, and other concepts in critical theory command assent. One must believe in these things. But it's important to realize that they are disintegrating doctrines that, taken as a whole, make for what Pope Benedict called the dictatorship of relativism. They're obligatory doctrines, but they impose what Reef calls a negative piety or the obligation of deconversion. Now, this dynamic of disintegration has played out in every domain of life. 21st century, does a nation have a distinct culture that rightly governs its common life? Can we say that male-female marriage is normative? It seems not. And even in relatively anodyne situations, you see things like the, the disabled referred to as the differently abled. Those who cross borders illegally are are not illegal immigrants, they are undocumented. And those who cross the border between male and female are in transition 
and we are told that we have a moral duty to affirm them. So we can see there's kind of the dynamic of disintegration in any kind of normative, uh, um, normative vision, any kind of vision of really what it means to be human uh, is, is, uh, it gets to be ruled out. And the churches are not immune. We have experienced what Reef calls the unremembering of tradition and the disenchantment of once towering truths. I cannot count the number of times I've heard theologians refer to Bernard Lonegan's opposition between the classical consciousness, metaphysically rigid, and historical consciousness. And, they, and, this, and this reference is always in order to make the apostolic inheritance more plastic and more adaptable. More recently, a cardinal in the United States wrote that the church needs to invade, embrace radical inclusion. Now, by logic, radical inclusion means that we must renounce the normative center, which of its nature imposes limits. I mean, you can't have a normative, you can't have a normative center without limits. In this regard, the cardinal is very much in line with the therapeutic mentality that Reef sees taking over in the West. Instead of boundary marking concepts such as right and wrong, or orthodox and heterodox, we are now trained to use plastic, open-ended words such as healthy or affirming or unhealthy or exclu exclusionary. And as in therapy, I think, we find that every individual is beckoned to find his own way. Now, three decades ago, so it seems, I think Reef helps He's, he walks on the edges of, of theology and has a, has a great deal to say about um, a sociologist's uh, analysis of, of the church's um, engagement with therapeutic culture. Now, three decades ago, uh, St. John Paul II issued Veritatis Splendor. The encyclical's affirmation of the intrinsic evil of certain acts, that is to say, prohibitions for which there are no exceptions, that this affirmation stuck like a bone in the throat, throats of Bernard Herring and other moral theologians. They regarded moral rules as external, and they wished to reframe the moral life in terms of a deeper internal commitment. And this presumed antagonism between prohibition and genuine interior assent is very much with us today. In fact, that's really at the center of Reef's analysis, that really the therapeutic assumes that all institutional forms are enemies of interior life. And so all prohibitions, all systems of discipline are enemies of true interior life. And here's Reef's description of this cultural change. Quote, the kind of man I see emerging as our culture fades to the next, resembles the kind once called spiritual. Because such a man desires to preserve the inherited morality freed from the external crust of institutional discipline. Now, you know, Reef wrote 70 years ago, 60 years ago, uh, and, uh, and the ambition to make moral discipline a self-administered enterprise has, I think, proven to be utopian. Reef, and by his interpretation Freud as well, Reef agreed with Emile Durkheim, and he's not surprised that it's utopian. He agreed with Durkheim. The human soul requires anchoring norms and authoritative institutions. Every society must have its Mount Sinai. Otherwise, its members teeter on the edge of disillusion into limitless possibilities. In a liquid world, in other words, we are unbound and undefined, not free. And of course, Mount Sinai must have a clarity to interpret, adjust, and impose its demands. And what happens when the clarity, the most educated, the most, those most invested in authoritative judgments abandon its role, their roles? Well, we slide towards atomization and disintegration. Our lives become blurry around the edges and our societies lose their distinctive characters. And 
blurring around the edges, losing our distinctive characters, we are of necessity absorbed into the commercial and technocratic empire that grows apace, imposing its dominance under the sign of choice. Thus we return to our present paradox. What we call polarization does not follow the old pattern of monarchy versus democracy or capitalism versus socialism. In 2023, the West is not divided between two ideological camps. On the contrary, over the last two decades, we've seen a tremendous consolidation of political, social, moral, and even spiritual attitudes among elites, among those who govern. Openness and its close cousins, diversity and inclusion, are in our political cultures, social environments, what one sociologist called God terms. They are the, they're the clinching, uh, uh, they don't, they're, they are the truths that don't need to be justified. As a consequence, those at the helm of authoritative institutions are very strangely anti-institutional. Champions of the marginal, they wield authority in order to undermine authority. Meanwhile, deprived of institutional leadership, the disestablished party of permanency often lacks the tools to articulate truth-affirming alternatives. I've got to say this is one reason why places like Angelicum are so, so important because it provides people an opportunity to become articulate and disciplined in, 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 the, in, in a truth-affirming vocation. As a consequence, with the exception of the church and a few recusant intellectuals, today's nihilistic status quo is not being challenged by articulate opponents. Rather, it faces a diffuse atmosphere of dissent and disloyalty that is tinged with anger and frustration, so-called populism, and that this dissent and disloyalty is tempted to a counter nihilism that is satisfied with destruction. So that, you know, once you have a kind of paradoxically anti-institutional leaders of institutions, you're gonna get this disintegrated uh, um, uh, cultural environment uh, in which people are rebelling against the liquid world, but they have no leaders who can articulate for them an alternative. So I'm gonna do a, a third and final approach from below, so to speak, to frame our political crisis, which as I'm arguing is a metaphysical crisis. In the early 1980s, Joseph Ratzinger published Freedom and Constraint in the Church, directly relevant actually to Reef's um, own preoccupations and concerns, although it approaches in a very different way. And this essay opens with a perceptive meditation on the dead end to which we have come. Ratzinger makes the straightforward observation that modernity promises greater freedom. I think that's correct. Sort of the modern project it has within itself a promise not just of material progress, but of ever greater personal freedom. Yet in spite of the many permissions we have been granted, we do not ourselves feel free. Ratzinger notes the, what he calls, strange ambiguity of all liberation processes. They require destroying traditional forms, forms of life. So so-called political and moral pro progress involves enticing, even coercing people to leave the supposed infancy of dependency and to enter into the adulthood of independence. And this obviously would seem a gain for liber liberty just on its face by definition. But the Bible teaches otherwise. In the New Testament, the Greek word eleutheria is translated as free or freedom. And here's how Ratzinger sums up this important concept in the Bible. Quote, it means the possession of full rights, full membership. And this is the crucial phrase, being at home, end quote. He, continu he continues with an emphasis on belonging and being part of identity-defining institutions. Quote, the free man is one who is at home, that is, one who really belongs to the household. Freedom 
has to do with being given a home, end quote. Of course, he has in mind here that uh, we are called into the household of God, which is the, ultimately the most trustworthy home to be a member of. Now, the open society consensus and the triumph of the therapeutic have taken down the walls of our homes in the West. The collapse of marriage and the remarkable phenomenon of childless adults show how far this progress has advanced. I mean, literal loss of homes in any meaningful sense. Our societies and cultures have been critiqued, disenchanted, and deconstructed. Progressives put up lawn signs declaring, hate has no home here. I certainly appreciate the sentiment, but in truth, the progressive ambition has been to overturn the household sustaining and homemaking norms of traditional institutions. And as a consequence, and this is Ratzinger's argument in, in this essay, as a consequence, we are less at home. In other words, we are less free. And so again, I return to our current situation and this problem of polarization. The party of change has promised freedom, but as Pope Benedict suggested decades ago, its ascendancy has undermined the bases for a strong culture of freedom in the West. So not surprisingly, growing numbers of people are frustrated and angry. You know, in other words, when you get your promise something and you get the opposite, you tend to get um, frustrated and angry. And so hence a lot of uh, voters in the West. And to counter this populist discontent and disguise the way in which progressive liberation has abandoned us to enslavement to the principalities and powers that govern this world, our political elites rely on prevarication and, I would submit, polarizing propaganda. I mean, the, the source of polarization in our society comes from elite defense of the open society status quo um, and not from those who are challenging it. It's, 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 it's our elite status quo that warns us that Hitler is at the door, about to return. Auschwitz is around the corner, insists the party of change. And only we, they say, can protect you from its horrors. So I think the disintegration leads to rebellion and then it gets exacerbated by um, a, a redoubled exercise, paradoxical exercise of this paradoxical anti authoritarian authority on the part of our elite. Now, conveniently, I have gone on a long time, perhaps too long, diagnosing our troubled times. And this leaves me with only a few minutes to speak about our role as uh, Christians, very conveniently for me, because of course, what's wrong is easy, what, what to do about it is always the hard part. As I used to tell my staff when I would come to work, I'd say, uh, I know what I'm against, remind me, what am I for? Yeah, it's hard to keep the, what you're for in mind uh, when there's so much to be against. So I'll, give a, put, I'll take an effort, brief effort, to, to say something constructive here. First, the political and economic revolutions of the 19th century disintegrated, we're not, this is not the first time, disintegrated a great deal of traditional solidarity and spawned often debilitating social conflict, the Industrial Revolution, 19th century, as well as the political revolutions, the French Revolution. In response, Leo XIII urged a cooperative relation between social classes in order to moderate extremes. And he put a special emphasis on the responsibilities of the powerful to make sacrifices to achieve, so, or to restore social equilibrium. Over the last two generations, our political forms have remained intact, unlike the 19th century. But we've undergone a cultural revolution of unprecedented scope. Moreover, during the last 30 years, our societies have been remade economically and demographically by globalization. Now, undoubtedly, we need a similar spirit of, spirit of cooperation to moderate the extreme dislocations caused by these revolutions. And as Pope Francis rightly emphasizes, this restoration of equilibrium will require reawakening the powerful to their responsibilities for the common good. But Leo XIII did, offered more than moral exhortation. He provided astute social analysis. And like Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Leo XIII saw society as a system. In the wake of the French Revolution, the nation had become the instrument 
and guarantor of new rights, both political and economic rights. And this inflation of the political gave rise to ideological temptations to guard against the dangers of the state usurpation of all authority, or very real danger in the late 19th and in the early 20th century as the sort of uh, totalitarian um, disasters of the 20th century indicate. To guard against the dangers of state us usurpation, Leo XIII championed the natural, pre-political institution of the family and the supernatural, supra-political institution of the church. The family, in other words, would pinion the state from below, and the church would pinion the state from above. I think we need to adapt Leo XIII's insight and apply it to our postmodern era of disintegration, which is quite different from the modern era of ideological politics. Today's revolutionaries certainly seek to capture state power. But the open society consensus and economic neoliberalism are anti-totalitarian. Their ambition is to weaken all solid features of life, including political institutions, and to do so in order to clear space for choice, choice to reign supreme. As a consequence, a Leonine doctrine, social doctrine for our times requires strengthening what are the necessary societies across the board. That is to say, the civitas, the, the, the political realm, the family, and the church. And truth be told, all three are in bad shape today. Therapeutic language and technocratic ambitions to rationalize traditional modes of so social organization have undermined the authority of the church, the family, and the nation. At the very least, we must refrain from participating in this project of weakening. As a positive measure, we need to restore the met some metaphysical density to our collective imaginations and renew the authority of these necessary societies. Now, what this is going to mean is obviously going to vary according to circumstances. But in the broadest strokes, let me just outline some thoughts here. I think we need to something in the spirit of humane vitae to address the full spectrum of threats to marriage and family. Threats that are now far more extensive than contraceptive technology. For example, the now common phenomenon of infertility by choice is unprecedented in human history. I mean, contraceptive methods are, I mean, the technology change, but con contraceptive uh, uh, efforts to uh, uh, stymie, to control female infertility are, are age old. But infertility by choice is really unprecedented in human history. Although clearly related to the rainbow agenda, I would submit that women without children are likely to revolutionize our societies far more deeply than the already damaging LGBT agenda. I think it's, when you get a quarter of all women in a, in a, in a population that have decided not to have children, uh, you, you're, and, they, and as they mature in age, it, it's, it's bound to have really, really profound revolutionary effects. So we, need a, we need something as ambitious as Humana Vitae to look at that full spectrum of threats to marriage and family. Now, when it comes to the Civitas, the political community, I think the church needs to reverse course and distance herself from the open society consensus that became normative in the church after Vatican II. We are not living in 1939. Instead of rampant nationalism, polling suggests that European youth are unwilling to fight and die to defend their homelands. The totalitarianism we face advances under the banner of diversity and inclusion, not blood and soil. We need to ignore the hysteria about fascism and articulate a nuanced view of the proper dignity of national loyalty and patriotic love. We certainly need to rebuff what Pope Francis calls aggressive nationalism, to be sure. But we also need to reestablish civic bonds, civic bonds that are strong enough to motivate citizens, especially the powerful, to make sacrifices for the common good. Now about the church, I'm at once pessimistic and optimistic. On the one hand, too often we employ therapeutic language almost unconsciously 
as well as these open society cliches, diversity, inclusion, and so on. And the German church, sadly, is carrying this tendency to its illogical conclusion by adopting today's imperative of weakening, and in that way to eliminate limits, boundaries, and borders within the church herself. It's a trajectory Philip Reef recognized in elite American Protestantism more than half a century ago. And yet, in our liquefied world, the church remains by far and away the strongest witness to anchoring loves and metaphysical commitments. Religious vocations, clerical celibacy, indeed the sheer fact of Catholic observance and loyalty become beacons of transcendent commitment in a disintegrated world. The supernatural reality, I can testify from experience talking to secular folks, the supernatural reality of the church's sacramental life has an, has an anchoring power that unbelievers sense and often envy. Thus, my optimism. Yes, the church is debilitated by the anti-metaphysical anti open society consensus, con consensus that too often we have taken on board in our own self-understanding. But in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So let me end on a speculative note. Uh, and I'm, because I'm in, at the Angelicum, it's fitting, and on a speculative note, not because it's the most important, after all, uh, the Eucharistic heart of the church and the invitation to union with God and Christ is far, far more important than a speculative thought. But I think it may end up, the speculative element may end up being the most salient political contribution we can make in this troubled 21st century. Karl Popper was crystal clear, an open society must renounce metaphysical truth. In his address to the German Bundestag in Berlin, Pope Benedict made the opposite assertion, equal and opposite assertion. This is what he said, quote, man is not merely self-creating freedom. Man does not create himself. He is intellect and will, but he is also nature, and his will is rightly ordered if he respects his nature, listens to it, and accepts himself for who he is, listens to it. It's a speculative moment. Listens to it and accepts himself for who he is as one who did not create himself. In this way, and in no other, is true human freedom fulfilled. As Christians, we need to recover the metaphysical and speculative voice of our tradition. We need to be witnesses, in other words, to the strengthening of being in an era of wholesale weakening. We need to restore man to his primordial home as a creature with a divinely ordained nature. And in addition to that, we need a theological strengthening of grace to, to uh, even as imp more important even than the strengthening of being, a strengthening of grace that calls us to our heavenly home. Thank you. Professor Reno, thank you very much. And now we have time for some questions. So please use the mics. Uh, thank you very much, excellent talk. Just the idea that you spoke about of unremembering of tradition in the sort of um, the party of change. Can you say a few more on how they view history and should we be understanding history in a more classical perspective um, to counteract how the party of change would understand history, things like um, CRT, et cetera, and the whole critical thinking of history? Could you see a few words on that? Uh, Reef, Reef um, he, he, the therapeutic, I mean, the weakening of being is also the weakening of the the, the burden of history, the past. Um, and I see CRT and other pedagogies as, um, it seems like it, 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 um, it imposes a yoke on us, right? Our evil, wicked past. But I don't think spiritually that's actually the real consequence. I think it actually is a release. We owe nothing to the, to the past. 
we've inherited nothing <clears throat> that we're obligated to, so I don't have a duty to pass that on to my children. Or, so I think it actually serves the, um, the ambition to, to clear away any kind of impediment in society to us finding a way to affirm ourselves and just live our lives. I mean, it's not really self-affirmation. For Reef, the goal of the therapeutic is to make room for life, mere life. You know, can't, you know uh, as Abby Hoffman said, God is dead and we did it for the kids. And I think uh, CRT is a way of, you know, founders, all these sorts of things. It's a weight that, like, I have a duty, I have obligations, I have to, I have to live up to my history. But if it's all perversion and, and evil, then I can, I can, once I'm done critiquing it, I can get on with life. Okay. I mean, if I could just add another thing here too. I, in my own, I didn't dwell on it. I, I use this more Reefian vocabulary, but I would say that, look, love is the great enemy of, I mean, it, love is the great concentrator. It's the great binder. Um, you know, it's, it's the great, um, yeah, it's the, it's the bond that goes around us and prevents us, it, it, it compels us love and limits us. And so any pedagogy of love is going to have the effect of a certain kind of Mount Sinai for students. And, uh, and so I think we live in a postmodern era where all the pedagogy is ordered towards the erosion and pro prohibition of love. Well, um, so Rusty, thank you very much for the presentation. It really kept my interest and made me think. And uh, just, I have a two, two questions. One is if we're not in 1939, um, might we be in a situation an analogous, following kind of the Twainian, uh, even though he never said it, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Uh, he didn't say it, but he would have been happy to have said it. Um, <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> uh, it, it, so following on this idea that history rhymes, might we be more, might our situation be more like the years between uh, uh, 1916 and 1922 in, in St. Petersburg. I mean, might we be in the chaos of that period, on the eve of that chaos, the calm be between a kind of, because the passions that that unleashed in those, in, in Soviet Union, what became the Soviet Union, was going in every direction. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's the one question. Then the other is, um, for those who want to start the build, promote the building blocks of a constructive solution to the diagnosis. Um, who should we be reading? Who are the people who you think provide the most constructive elements for a constructive solution? Because I, I agree that we've got one, tons of people who are really good at diagnosis. Uh, Pierre Manon, Charles Taylor, you go down a list of people who are really good at diagnosis. But who are the ones who offer us building blocks for constructive? Well, that's such a hard question. I'll start with the easy one, the Russian Revolution. I agree with Reef that historically you have, um, you have, you have uh, conflicts of faiths. And there's no question that Marxism functioned as a kind of a faith. Um, it had its own, I mean, uh, historical materialism is a truth claim. I mean, in a, it's a Hegelian inspired, you know, with the historical materialism as opposed to historical idealism. But it's a, it's a claim, a scientific claim, uh, and a strong truth. And so the idea was to transfer your loyalty from traditional authorities to this new authority. And that's very different from the age we live in, which is, uh, as I say, it's uh, doctrinally anti-authoritarian. Um, so that you, you, uh, it, you know, it's a, the, the equity, movement now, that's an old appeal to justice, and there's a kind of strength in that. But the, the diversity and inclusion are like hopelessly soft words that can kind of mean anything. Uh, 
And I think that that's emblematic of what I think is the sort of dominant establishment opinion, uh, obligatory openness, dictatorship of relatives, and so forth. So it's hard to see a historical precedent for that, uh, as opposed to one faith struggling for uh, control over the moral imagination of a population. Uh, Reef is very good on that. He thinks that this was a unique moment in human history. Um, you know, it's uh, not the replacement of one god with another god, but instead the promise that we'll all be better and happier and uh, more cheerful if we have no gods at all. Who's helpful? I, well, I mean, Pierre Menon doesn't just do diagnosis. He wants to recover, and I think he's very articulate about the recovery of, of political life. Um, as a, you know, of a, of a people, that a sense of being a people and then reckon, find, determining that uh, as a people we're going to shape our life, what the parameters of our life together will be. Um, so I think, I think he's, he's quite good on that. Uh, but I think we're hard pressed to find clear and articulate the, the humana vitae redux that I describe has yet to be written, it seems to me, um, although a lot of the pieces have been by various um, sociologists like Brad Wilcox and, and, uh, and others that have described the different elements of the breakdown for the family. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, the sort of in the church realm, you know, it, there, there are lots of good theologians to read on, on any number of different topics that, uh, that wind up sort of renewing the church's density as a, as a form of life, um, both as an intellectual project as well as a, a performative, enacted form of life. I also enjoyed your talk very, very much. Um, I just, uh, certain things that come to mind I'd like you to maybe comment on them. Um, during the French Revolution, a um, little bit that I've read about it, uh, it was also those who were in authority that, that promoted the, the new egalitarian society, the elite, the aristocracy. And the result of that was we had, you know, as you mentioned, uh, no, or not you mentioned, but Napoleon came out of this, you know, a dictator basically. And, he was going to impose this new egalitarian society on the rest of the world, so he went out and conquered you know, many of them. Uh, it, during the um, Bolshevik Revolution, there was, there was a great concern that what had happened in, during the French Revolution, that is a counter-reaction to the revolution, would take place in Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution. So they, they did all they could to make sure that didn't happen. Uh, is, is there something like that you think that could happen or is happening now? Uh, in, in, in the world today, this, this imposing uh, of, of a uh, society uh, change or a society that they think is, uh, uh, they don't know how to control it, think is better and, and taking steps to make sure that there isn't a counter-revolution or something that will disturb their new... Well, certainly the society. Klaus Schwab and um, the Great Reset and all that sort of thing is certainly a... Uh, an attempt to stem any kind of reversal of course in the West. Yeah, they're very powerful forces at work. And, and you know, the, um, in the United States, there's a certain amount of China envy in our elites. Um, if only we could, we elite people could exercise control over the population. We wouldn't, of course, do it quite so crudely, but it sure would be nice. We'd get things done, you know. People wouldn't. We could. <clears throat> so there's a there's a there's a strong there's a definitely a philanthropic uh, rationale for social control in the West, and also the anti-fascist rhetoric. Wow, I mean anyone who dissents in the United States, it's Jim Crow 2.0. It's uh, um, you know semi-fascism, and so that that kind of denunciatory rhetoric is. Because that's assassination rhetoric that, I mean, mainstream people in the West use assassination rhetoric 
Um, I, mean, uh, I mean, if you are a fascist truly or are a racist truly, you have no role to play in our society. You ought to have no role to play in our society. So go, running around calling people racist and fascists, you're, you're essentially exiling them. You're, you're kind of professionally, you're, you're, you're de-citizening them. And it's really quite shocking that our elites are so free with that language, given its, its meaning. But I, I mean, I'm not sure they know what they're doing when they say it, but or maybe they do. So that kind of social control is, is very, uh, and that's why so many people on the right are fearful of actually speaking, um, because the constant, you know, they, <clears throat> it's a professional assassination. Thankfully, it's not a literal assassination. We're in a different world than 1939, and people don't get bullets in the back of their head, um, but instead they get reputational destruction, Twitter mobs and all that sort of thing. Thank you very much for, um, well, this amazing speech, okay, because, well, there are so many topics. But you spoke about uh, credibility, and there was a part about credibility, and if I get it right, um, the, the reason why the party of uh, permanence lost the power over the institutions was because of the loss of credibility. So, if I get it right, I was just wondering, how it happened and what can we do with that? Should we go back to preach on the streets or is there any other option to, to gain this credibility again? Yeah, I, I mean, that's the narrative. I mean, the narrative is that, um, that uh, you know, the catastrophes of 1914 to 1945 discredited authoritative institutions in the West. Uh, but if you actually go back and read the histories, that's actually not right. There's a recent history of, um, uh, of anti-fascism in Germany in the church. And this author distinguishes between what he calls paternal Catholicism and fraternal Catholicism. <clears throat> in other words, Catholicism that is based on a kind of authoritative author authority versus one based on dialogue, if I could use that kind of language. And um, he's trying to argue that the paternal Catholicism is complicit with fascism. Uh, but if you actually read closely his account, it turns out that these paternal Catholics were actually much more consistently and effectively um, uh, opposed to uh, Nazism in Germany. And so it's really the post-war era when the narrative is, is written and there's a book in the United States, or a study in the United States that got published as a book called The Authoritarian Personality, published in 1949, extraordinarily influential. And in that book, the danger was, well, would fascism come to America? Well, it might because we have proto or pre-fascist sentiments in America. And what, is it, what are the signs of a pre-fascist person? Someone who makes a strong distinction between male and female roles. Um, someone who has a rigorous understanding of morality, um, someone who sees the father as um, the head of the household. In other words, a person with a traditional view of morality is a proto-fascist. <clears throat> and so this influences the way that people think about, um, think about the effect of that social catastrophe. When you look back, uh, Hitler's movement was revolutionary, um, a revolutionary movement, not a traditionalist movement in any meaningful sense that drew upon all these ersatz scientific, um, scientific claims about race and, and so forth that were, that were as implausible as Marxist <coughs> science about history. So, uh, yeah, like I said, I think that it was after the war, and that's my book, Return of the Strong Gods, that uh, there were dissenters. Hannah Arendt was one of the dissenters in her own way. Um, but there were, the consensus grew that strong loves lead people towards uh, totalitarianism. And so we have to have a society where people love less um, and love less, less strongly. And to do that, we have to disenchant the objects of their love. Uh, and so anybody who has uh, strong convictions is, uh, in Karl Popper's view, he's very clear, you know, Plato 
is the, he lays the foundations for totalitarianism, uh, Plato. So anybody with a contemplative impulse is a potential totalitarian. You got to keep people busy as technocrats. You know, just just increase marginal utility. Don't let yourself be seduced by this question about knowing the truth. Because if you seek the truth, you might actually be convinced that you found it. In which case, you're going to become a moral monster. I mean, how? I mean, it's Isaiah Berlin, basically. I mean, it's really the consensus view in the West after after World War II. I also, I would love. I would first of all, I would like to mention something very interesting which came up to my mind during the lecture. How subtle is the difference between uh, being populist or, and being called populist <laughs> by the leaders of <laughs> and creators of open society? I would like. Uh, I, I I noticed it when uh, in the beginning I heard about the, the the political party who was who is in charge in Poland now, because during the lecture all, uh, most of the adjectives terms which were mentioned <laughs> are those who are used <laughs> to 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 attack to to describe the political party. Who is, who is in charge in Poland, and uh, but that's just uh, just to mention. But my question is: uh, Is it uh, can it be the solution against the idea of open society that we uh, should focus more on, on on a very urgent problem, which is? Uh, intergeneration communication mm. in in families and larger groups uh, like for example uh, schools like uh, could it be also the, the task of the church yes yeah uh, um, yeah populism I mean I just think analytically it's simply defined as the rebellion of the many against the few and it can be right wing, it can be left wing, it can be no wing, it can be inarticulate, it can be articulate. Uh, but that's the that's how I would simply describe. And the, we we are clearly in a populist moment. Um, but I think populism is not the same as polarization. Polarization would suggest two. I mean, polarization would su suggest two rival rival political visions. And I think populism is almost exclusively a, um, a negation of the status quo, a rejection. It doesn't actually articulate an alternative. Um, and, I, and as I argued in my lecture, it's reflective of a disintegrated social consensus or disintegrated society and, and not, a, and not a, a polarized one in the way that Germany was polarized at the end of the Weimar Republic and you had you know, Nazi and communist uh, bands that were fighting in the streets of Berlin. Uh, you know, you have Antifa forces in Portland, Oregon, and uh, Proud Boys in on the right. But uh, yeah, it's, it doesn't strike me as as um, these don't strike me as significant phenomena in in the American context, and uh, you don't really have it at all in the European context. I mean, Gilets jaunes as a protest movement, again, it's a kind of attempt to say no. It's not a revolutionary project to replace the current regime with a different regime. I mean, we really can't imagine, and all of the, popu almost, yeah, all the populism functions within the regime framework. It's an electoral um, reality, not a, not a, um, reality in the streets. I don't think people really envision an alternative to the current political arrangements. I, I, it's hard, I mean, it's, I don't discern any, anybody. I mean, Brexit, it was, it was um, uh, Tony Blair who revolutionized the British form of government um, on a, for no reason at all uh, 20 years ago or 15 years ago. 
by establishing effectively a Supreme Court and transforming the House of Lords, all those sorts of things, under no political pressure whatsoever. But I, like almost out of a, anyway, it's not altogether clear to me why, that, why the Brits did that. Uh, in contrast to the Brexit, not, uh, Nigel Farage never suggested any changes in the constitutional regime in Britain. Uh, nor do populists in, in the United States. Uh, I don't know about Italy. Has Maloney suggested any changes in the governmental structures in Italy? Yeah, so like, how is this, how, how could it be that the disruptive force offers no political, um, no, no even, not even any kind of major reforms in the political process, and why could this possibly be seen by elites as a threat to the status quo? You know, it's, uh, so I think, again, it really begs us to dig down and sort of say, what is being threatened by this? And, uh, and what, what is threatening is a disloyalty to the open society consensus. That's very, I think, disturbing to those who see it as the only, um, the only barrier to the return of Hitler. And if Italians are, are upset about, you know, Brussels usurping Italian sovereignty or immigration or something like that, that uh, we're on the cusp of some kind of uh, cultural transformation. It's a very, anyway, I, I find myself um, kind of thinking that's a, that's a deep, puzzlement that we ought, we ought to think about. Uh, you know, and it's a, I mean, I think our vocations, and, and Father Michael, to your question again, the fact that we don't have good sources is telling that our vocations are, is to be, is to articulate, as I said in my book, Return of the Tron Gods, to articulate the noble, to use our reason to purify um, uh, uh, the, um, the, the demand for these strong anchors and to offer people noble loves rather than debasing ones. Because it's my conviction that people do not want to tread water in, uh, forever in, a, in, a, in an ocean of limitless possibilities. They don't want to live in a liquid world. And if we don't provide them with noble foundations, noble um, uh, ennobling restorations of institutional authority, they will throw their loyalty behind perverse uh, and de um, debasing uh, loves. As I put it, the gods from above rather than the dark gods that come from below. Um, so the, the, the establishment in the West is not wrong, perhaps, to be so fearful. You know, a, a nature pours a vacuum, they've created a vacuum of love, and uh, the love is gonna return, and it could certainly return in a vicious way. Uh, I don't discount that possibility, so it's our vocation to offer uh, a higher loves rather than um, lower and debasing loves. So now Father Rector and one more questions. I just have a, you know, optimistic uh, observation and it's, you can respond to it. I, I mean, it, as you were saying, and I agree with the, the atmosphere in 1917 uh, would have presumed the possibility of a strong metaphysical rival to the Christian tradition and to the classical Western framework in you know, the Marxist ontology uh, and the faith in it. And it seems like the strange thing about the, the power of the social order we live in today is certainly not in its deep metaphysical commitments. In that respect, I think there's a huge opening. I mean, there's a opportunity because you have what you just referred to, uh, human beings that lack some deep mooring or understanding a perception of what they're doing. And in that sense, the Catholic faith is like, almost like the last man standing in a world where there's been the, the erosion of a lot of deeper doctrines and ideas about the human person, even from older enlightenment forces or you know, liberal normative conceptions of human nature. Um, on the other side, it seems like there is some reason for sobriety in that it's just so powerful, the alliance between the modern, um, how would you call it, um, 
necessarily metaphysically agnostic liberal state in its constitutional polity allied with the huge international system of um, economic gestation. So, you know, but at the same time, that, that system has to work in a way by allowing, uh, it's vulnerable in the sense that it has to allow all comers in to provide utilities and access to all, precisely so as to sustain participation in the market. So it does have a certain doctrinal softness so as to be porous and open. And it seems to me that means the church has a tremendous cultural opportunity, a structural opportunity to enter in and provi provide a deep vision of reality in a world where there are not a lot of competitors. But of course that might be too optimistic a thought. As I said, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Um, I agree. I mean, to, to your point about uh, the, the kind of paradoxical ubiquity and, and the, 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 the regime that we live in, the cultural regime, is at once incredibly weak, but yet has tremendous kind of pervasiveness. Um, an example I give is, you know, you're at some fancy pants university in the United States, you're 20 years old, you're purple hair, pierced, radical lesbian student, and in the morning, you're picketing some Kyle Duncan guest speaker. And in the afternoon, you fill out your application to be a McKinsey consultant. And the ability to go from a kind of posture of kind of revolutionary openness to working for like an uber establishment institution is on the one hand, it's like, wow, th these people can't possibly believe what they claim to believe on the one hand. On the other hand is, wow, whatever this regime is, it has tremendous absorptive power. Uh, and I think Reef gets at that, the absorptive power of, of, the, of the regime of endless permission or the, what I call the open society consensus. So I do, I do think that we should be very sober about that absorptive power. And it certainly it, it has its designs on the church. There's no question about it, that regime. Um, because the church is, as you say, kind of the last man, it's the last institution in the West, it's the only institution in the West, in the West left that hasn't been swallowed. Universities now, I think, are, have been swallowed by that regime. Uh, and part of its strength is that, well, there's no question its strength comes from its, I mean, it's not the rainbow flag, ultimately, and it's not the critical race theory. I think it's rather the Baconian project of the use of reason for relief of man's estate. First of all, it's a, really similar to Marxism. The goal is not to uh, understand the world, but to, trans to change it. So Baconianism is fundamentally opposed to contemplation. Uh, that would be a moral failure not to use your reason to transform the world. And the Baconian project requires everything to be made available for re-engineering. Everything has to be made available. So you have to strip the world of any of these humanizing institutions that could be an impediments to the raw material of our humanity being available. That's obvious in economic affairs. Traditional forms of life had to be weakened, in some cases destroyed, in order to make labor available for the factory work in 19th century England. Um, uh, and now it's a more advanced, I think transgenderism is the cutting edge of making the human genome available for um, um, our, the use of reason to re-engineer and perfect. Uh, so, so I think that's really the big driver here. It's very hard to resist. I mean, I mean, it's a it's a gospel promise. Oh, that ultimately, this promise is we're going to defeat suffering um, and overcome it. Uh, people will no longer suffer. You know the radical inclusion that Cardinal McElroy is promoting is a kind of we're going to. Radical inclusion means no one will have to suffer for being abnormal. 
or, or on the margins. Everyone will be affirmed in the way that they wish to be affirmed. So no one will feel that inner feeling of not belonging, which is a kind of, which as we all know, is a, can be a very profound source of suffering. That's a kind of social, it's an, it's an re-engineering of our moral imaginations to eliminate suffering. Um, but, you know, we're, there's no question, we're, we already are in Europe, no Down syndrome children being born. Uh, and, you know, I think in the lifetime of the younger people in the room will have artificial means of producing children. I think the demographic collapse is going to actually require it. And it'll be then taken up as a ideal way to um, perfect the human genome. And, and so it'll come under the sign of choice. It won't be obligatory, but it'll turn out to be having children in the old way will be like smoking. Uh, it'll be deeply shamed uh, as a um, irresponsible way to conduct yourself when you're bringing children to the world without the benefits of um, genetic preselection. Uh, like, how could you possibly do that? So I think the, jug the, the, that juggernaut is a very powerful. And it, it's, you know, I didn't talk about it in the, in the, in the talk because I haven't synthesized my thinking well enough to be able to present it in a, in a way that's really fully coherent. But the technocratic project and the cultural, the deculturalization or the disenchantment of all cultural authority definitely work hand in hand. Sorry to go on so long on that. That's what, like I said, that's my next thing I'm going to try to work out is that connection. The last question. For the reason of time, I'll just stick to one question. Um, you mentioned, and I do not think it was uh, something that uh, you appreciated, and kind of you worried about it, I guess, is that um, women without children will revolutionize, uh, will be like a sort of revolution from like more than anything else. But um, I'm wondering whether this uh, may be only something negative because like there have already been women without children who have revolutionized the world, like St. Catherine of Siena, Teresa of Avila, Lisieux, and so on and so forth. So, and to use a quite recent example, although, okay, it's not revolution, but like it's a Christian woman, very controversial, politically, Angela Merkel, who doesn't have kids and she... Troubling spoke. to me. Yeah. Um, I so, think the, my view I mean, is that no one should be permitted to hold public office that hasn't had children. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the first... It changes your horizon yeah. of what... Uh, it changes your horizon. Um, you know, the, uh, if you have children, then you're... Just, it's a natural form of transcendence, having children, because you live beyond your life, so to speak, through your children. And so you're, as a political leader, as any responsible member of society, you're thinking beyond your own mortality. And I think people without children don't. And I would say also that, look, uh, um, to, to forgo children for the sake of a higher vocation is fundamentally different from just not having children, uh, which is a kind of fate that um, a large percent, I think one of my demographic demographer friends said that within the next 20 years, 25% of women over 40 in America will never have had children. Uh, Men have, in, in primitive societies, been frozen out of fertility by alpha males who then take all the women for themselves. But I, I don't think there's been a time in human history when women um, have uh, chosen, not to, not, chosen infertility simply for its own sake or for the sake of what, I don't know, so they could travel more uh, or for the sake of their careers or whatever it is that the rationale they give. Um, as opposed to, you know, choosing it for the sake of devotion to, you know, to God's children, you know, in your ministry or in your uh, religious vocation. Um, so, yeah, I think it's fundamentally different. It's unprecedented in human history. It's going to have to have really dramatic effects. I think war is probably the most primitive male experience, not, not children, uh, whereas I think motherhood is the primitive female experience. Professor Reno, thank you very much again for this beautiful lectures.
Thank you very much to your all here in Angeliku Maula and all of you in front of your screens. And I, I would like to invite you to the next GP2 lectures, which will be given by Thierry Dominique Ombrecht on 21st of April at the same time, half past 4 p.m. Thank you very much.